moving from one US 800 meter world champion to another, we're a little late on this, but I think Mo was on the Pivot podcast, which is hosted by former NFL players Fred Taylor, Ryan Clark, and Channing Crowder. She made an appearance on March 17th, and I thought it was really interesting. A thing kind of reminds you she's she's good at this in the media. She she's been in the spotlight from an early age. She's still only 20 years old, but I found it to be a compelling interview. I thought she was not she was fairly open with them, and I thought they established her rapport quickly. I enjoyed listening to it, but there were a few quotes from this that really caught my eye. And part of it is she hasn't done a ton of media since last year's World Championships. She wins that race, thrilling duel in the home straight against Keely Hodgkinson, and then doesn't run at all the rest of the season, doesn't run at all indoors this season. We haven't really had the opportunity to talk to her. And she's undergone all these changes. She ch- switched coaches from Milton Mallard to Bobby Kersey, and she moved out to Los Angeles to join his training group. She changed agencies from West Felix to Alliance Sports, which is a company that only represents NFL athletes apart from a thing Mo and Brandon Miller, her boyfriend. So those were both interesting changes, but then they talked about, so they talked about a lot of things. They didn't go into all the details about changing coaches, that sort of thing, but a few details that stood out to me. One, she mentioned she'd been carrying an injury at the 2022 world championships on this podcast. They didn't go into details about what it was. She had intimated at the time, something might've been wrong or that there was some issue. It wasn't easy for her. I didn't know exactly what that meant. But now we know she was hurt. And Robert, that probably explains why she didn't race at all the rest of the season, I would guess. If you were injured at Worlds, that to me, I can understand why you wouldn't go to Europe and keep pushing it. You would want to just heal. No doubt. For the record, didn't we bring this up on a podcast before? Because I swear you've told me that before. And I remember you using that same language. I tried to look it up. Apologize for repeating ourselves. Told you what? Thought we brought up the fact that a thing Mo was on the pivot pot pass. We may have brought it up, but we haven't talked about some of these comments she made because I thought some of the stuff was really interesting. But then one of the things was that she's considered quitting running three times in recent years. One of those was in the pandemic summer of 2020. She just graduated high school and she mentioned that, you know, she didn't have a high school team. She ran for the Trenton Track Club, which she'd been running for since she was six years old. And once she graduated, she'd been going to all these races, mostly by herself or herself and a couple of coaches. She'd been racing pros since junior year of high school, maybe even earlier. She didn't have that team experience that so many athletes have either in high school or college. Even Caitlin Tui, she got to run the DMR in high school. Drew Hunter, he ran the DMR in high school. I think Mo didn't have that. And it just wasn't fun for her. She was pushing herself. She was training just alone over the summer. She'd been alone for a while in the sport. And then once she got to Texas A&M, that was really what revitalized things. But she essentially said that was the the game change. One of the game changing moments that convinced her to continue in the sport. That and also, she put in all this effort since she was six years old, and you know now she was really starting to see big gains, and she didn't want to just have that effort go to waste and her give up on the sport. Well, that's interesting to me, and that concerns me. Why? Because she's no longer on a team. I, I, it's easy to get lost as a pro. I mean, Weldon was trained by himself. We didn't have a group. That's why in 2000 for the trials, I moved out there to try to train with him. I mean, he lived a lot of times just alone in Flagstaff, which I think can be hard to do. To have the team structure, give you something to do, I just think it makes it a lot easier. You don't have to question like, no, I guess he's got Bobby Kersey and there's other pros there. So he's got a group, which helps. You're not just a total free agent. But. Yeah, I I disagree that she doesn't have a team. They're branding themselves as Formula Kersey and 
she's got Brandon Miller, who she's obviously very close with. He's with her at a lot of these workouts and going to races. It's not, you don't have the entire team like at Texas A&M, but I think this is, seems like a different experience for her than it was in high school. But just the concept, I didn't realize she wasn't on the high school team in high school. Like, I don't know. Call me old fashioned. Like, I'm seeing Leo and Lux Young, they've quit their high school teams. They're running just for Sean Brosnan and they're around doing these open meets and flying all over the country. Is it really necessary? I mean, I, I can say that about so much of modern society. Like, is it really necessary that USC and UCLA are going to be in the Big Ten? Weldon and I were talking about this. And they're going to be flying to like, Maryland to, to play a field hockey game on a Friday. Like you could just play locally. Like you could just run your high school season. I know you're not going to run as fast, but you have your college or pros to, to go all out. Like, I don't know. I, I just, uh, well, it's going to work the other way too, right now too, right? Maryland's going to fly to USC for a field hockey game. It's just so stupid. Could, could they just do football and basketball and keep the other sports in a different conference? I don't know. But that's a whole different conversation. I look, I'm not really going to question the development of an athlete who has had just nothing but success in the sport, who was a US champion at 16 and an Olympic champion at 19. I mean, there are different paths to, to success, but I can't I think it's not like they screwed her up. She turned out pretty well. Right. But a few big things to take away from this one, she's been doing this since she was seven, right? Six, I believe. Six. Oh, that's a big difference. And you know, when she talks about the three times she wanted to quit, who knows what that really means. But so that's number one. Number two, this is a huge year for her. It's a big change from going from college to being out of college. The environment, training. So sure, she has a team, but it's a completely different team. Pivotal year. Let's see what happens. Apart from the whole new coaching setup and all that stuff, Bobby Kersey's never really coached a pure 800 meter runner. I mean, she's a 400 runner, but whatever. And number three, she's still 20 years old. Like she's figuring out her, like not even figuring out her life. Like she's just a total kid, man. So she says this stuff and she may retire. I think John wants to touch on some of these quotes about retirement, but she's 20. Most people in their 20 don't even want to know what they want to do with their lives. And she's already world and Olympic champion and undefeated as a professional at 800 meters. Oh, yeah. Maybe, I mean, you yeah, know, maybe she gets to next year and she thinks totally differently. But the retirement thing, she didn't come out and say, I'm going to retire. But what was very clear is that she has a passion for modeling. That's something she's really wanted to do since she was 11 years old. Got a clip, John. I'll play it. Modeling is 100% in my eyes view. I, I honestly, I don't know if I should say this. I make jokes all the time about me retiring like within the next two years and just like going to walk the runway. But I would love to go walk on the runway, do editorial shoots. I would love to do anything in the fashion world. When I was like maybe 11 or 10, I remember myself walking in the kitchen and doing like a catwalk that was it was it was outrageous but like it was the best thing i have been committed to being a model since i was super young look that doesn't disturb me no offense to any models out there that are listening to the podcast but how hard is it to be a model like we started let's run because you can't run all day and we were running 120 130 140 miles a week when you're an 800 meter runner and you're running like 20 miles a week, you've got a lot of damn free time. So she could pretty much m sit there and let them take pictures of her or walk and occasionally smile and then figure out a way to train for an hour or do it in the off season when she's not running cross country or indoors, which she hasn't been doing. So there's plenty of time for that. And it is crazy how young she is. I'll say the same thing about her. As I said about Jakob Ingebrigtsen, who said the same thing. Well, I don't know how long I'm going to do this, blah, blah, blah. There's no chance in hell that either one of them walks away until they're to the 2028 Olympics. I mean, we're almost there. She's living in LA. She's going to get, I don't care what, this is a pivotal year because Kersey hasn't coached 800. But she's going to get motivated for the Olympics next year, no matter what. It's the Olympics. 
And then you've got LA Olympics. She lives in LA. And if you want to be a model, hell, she can be just the runner model. Like that's the easiest way for her to model is people will put her in magazines because she's famous, like Serena Williams on these covers. You build your brand like that. She becomes a Serena Williams of track and field. Yeah, the people who just model on their own, Robert, you said, how hard can it be? They seem, half of them, or majority of them seem miserable. They talk about the pressure. And, well, I don't know. Being objectified of your body is one way that can easily take on. I, th- I think if anyone can handle it, it's sort of a fun side gig. It's a thing. So, Yeah, because she's always a beat. And I didn't mean like how hard, like mentally. Like, yeah, the, the, the stereotypical Kate Moss, you know, anorexic model look is hard to do. But now we're into big and beautiful or whatever. It doesn't matter. There are all types of different uh, models out there. All right. I'll play another clip related to this. So for you, when is it going to be enough? And what's going to tell you it's okay to hang the spikes up? Uh, <laughs> when I have no time to run track because I'm modeling too much. <laughs> That's literally it. I mean, I don't know. Just checking off my goals. I Checking off my goals. I think I am definitely happy with what I've done so far, but there are some more things that I want to get done. So if I do get a chance to accomplish these goals, like win a double at a world championships or, you know, whatever the case may be, I think realistically, because I know that there is something else I want to do, I would be okay with letting it go a little sooner than, you know, maybe someone else would. Uh, And because I've been running for so many years, um, then I believe that I would be absolutely fine with just taking the next step to do, you know, another career or, you know, be part of the sport as an ambassador or something. See, I found that clip very revealing. Robert says there's no chance she would retire before 2028. I'm not so sure about that. Because if you imagine, let's say she does the 400-800 this year at Worlds, wins both of them. And next year she wins the Olympics again in the 800 and she breaks the world record. Like if she just checks off all of those goals, she'll have completed track and field, essentially. Or at least in the 800, you know? There's nothing else for her to do, which would be insane because she'd be 21 or 22. But it's kind of like Sydney McLaughlin Lavroni, right? She has essentially completed the 400 hurdles. So she needs to go and find new challenges in other events. That would be similar to what we'd see with Mo in the 800. Again, this is a woman who's never lost a professional 800. Now, things could be totally different if she starts taking some losses. Maybe she wants to stick around a long, little longer. But if she continues on the progression she's on and she starts getting all these goals, Yes, I could see her just hanging it up. It's, I think it's partially also going to be dependent if some modeling agency comes to her and handles, hands her some contracts and says, hey, we'd love you to do this full time after the 2024 Olympics. Yeah, maybe she takes that. But if she doesn't get that offer, then I think as Weldon said, maybe the best way for her to get these modeling opportunities is to remain in the sport and to continue winning because then other brands, magazines, they're going to want to have a successful athlete like her out there pushing some of these things. So she switched to Adidas. Doesn't Adidas kind of do runways and stuff like that? And did I say she could win three Olympics? Did I already say this? She'd be 26. It's crazy. But there's no way she retires at 22, John. This is going to come back to bite me. Well, I guess if she got the world record, pulls the double this year. This John, she has to pull the double this year and get the world record and get the Olympics and then just retire before the home Olympics at 22. No, I don't think it happens. But I've been pro- proven wrong once or twice on this podcast before. She may not be the best 400 meter runner in her own group. We're just handling the, John's handling the double to both I'm her I'm not and handling it to her. I'm saying Only if one she of them does can win that. It. And it's quite convenient that she and Sydney have never lost a, four, a professional 800 or 400 hurdles. I know Sydney's lost one, but they never run them also. So it, it makes it a lot easier to never lose one when you only run like four or five a year. I just think you guys, you're not listening to what she's saying. Like she has been, okay, she's only been a professional since the summer of 2021, but she's been running professional type schedules since 
2019 when she was a junior in high school. And she's been running since she was six years old as part of the Trenton Track Club. Like, that's a long time in the sport. Now, she hasn't been at the very, very elite, but she's been doing all these age group nationals. Like, she's been in doing running for 15 years at this point. And to her, it suddenly sounded like from that conversation, you know, that it's starting to feel like it's taking a long time. And also, Robert, you didn't listen to the whole podcast. You're saying, oh, how much time up can modeling take? That sort of thing. She said, she spends a lot of time at training in track and field and she doesn't really have time to fit in modeling apart from, you know, maybe you knew what fashion week. She, this is her words, Robert. You might be skeptical, but she said she doesn't really have time to be a full-time model at the moment. She's because track takes so much time in her schedule. Okay. You guys have a challenge for you. Tell me the last time a thing well lost an 800 meter race. USA Indoors 2020. Correct, John. There's no way Robert knew that. Yeah, <laughs> yeah Robert, you're saying this authoritatively. Did you look this up? Or you just... I, I, like... I was going to say, like, I know she lost a race right at the beginning of COVID. Like, I, then I'm like, oh, wait, was that a 600 that she lost? I knew she lost some race that time because we've talked about this before. Do you guys remember anything about the race? I am assuming RJ Wilson won because she always wins. It, it was USA Indoors in Albuquerque, right? 2020. I don't remember details about the race, though. John, that was good. That was good. That's why, like, Jeopardy needs you. You did some, like, is it induct deductive reasoning? I don't know what it was. RJ Wilson did win, but this was a prelim. Wait, she didn't make Wilson the final? Yeah, Ajay Wilson ran 204.86. A thing mode just starts fading, fading, fading. She ran 214.18. I don't think we need to laugh. I mean, she was a high, she was a high schooler at the time. I know she won this USA the 600 the year before. Um, it's quite a fade, but I don't know. Something high schoolers have bad races. I'm just saying it's crazy that this. I think this shows how much she benefited from the Olympics being postponed. She's never lost since. But, and she's still 20 years old. I mean, it's just stunning. And it's a lot. It's Olympic champion, worlds, worlds, Olympics, worlds. What she should do is in 2026, if she's still operating at a high level, take the year off, you know, keep running. It's not like she, just, do not stop running, but just, you know, and, and try the modeling, see if you miss it. I bet you get bored with the modeling. Come back. Also, she's 20. I mean, if you're a superstar name and well, she needs to be a double Olympic champion, whatever, you can still get paid. Currently, she still gets paid a lot more for running track and field. Right. That's what I'm saying. If she gets some big significant modeling offer after the 2024 Olympics, maybe she takes it. But if she doesn't have the opportunities and she's got a nice fat Nike contract and she keeps getting these American record bonuses or world championship bonuses, yeah, it would probably be foolish to leave that behind for no guarantees. But I, I think kind of, I don't know, is she some big modeling prospect or is this just something she really wants to do? I don't, I don't know where she fits in in that world. Well, Sid, I think people are going to get mad at me mansplaining this. Keep going. If you want to take 2026 off, that's fine. 2028, go down in history, win five or six Olympics. Then take a year off, 